All right, let's get started. So I'm Eric Domain, filling in for Professor Carger, who's traveling today. Um, I'm another algorithms guy. <laughs> I like algorithms. And we're going to continue the spirit of online algorithms today and talk about a problem called paging. So you've all done online algorithms, I guess, in this online lecture? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I'm assuming so. So anyone not do the on online class? I won't tell. Carger. <laughs> OK, good. Um, so then this should be familiar. So you have a problem. The idea is the input is coming one little bit at a time. And an online algorithm only gets to see the one, bit, one little bit and has to make a decision right then and there. Whereas an offline algorithm gets to know the whole input ahead of time and gets to make decisions with knowledge of the future. So online algorithms are like regular non-time traveling algorithms. Offline algorithms have prescience and can see the future. And our goal is to get a good competitive ratio or competitiveness, whatever you want to call it, uh, where for all inputs, the performance of the online algorithm is within a factor of alpha of the optimal offline algorithm for that input. So this is very powerful. This is like uh, hindsight, in hindsight, perfect hindsight. We want to do within a constant factor or some small factor of the uh, best possible we could have done if we knew the future. And sometimes you add an additive constant. I, I don't think that will actually be necessary in this class. Sometimes you do it, then you call it asymptotic competitiveness. So is that familiar? Uh, so then what we're going to work on today is a specific problem that's important and interesting. It comes up, originally it came up in the idea of virtual memory. You know, your computer has virtual memory in addition to the real RAM. It sometimes uses disk to store things. Uh, but these days, uh, paging is a problem that comes up in caching at all levels of the memory hierarchy. So what should you be storing in the cache on your CPU versus what should you be storing in the cache in your motherboard versus what should you be storing in the cache on your, in your disk or RAM or whatever. All of these are relevant. You've got way too much data. How much You can only afford to put a little bit close to the CPU. And paging is all about uh, which data to keep. So the word paging comes from external memory. But really, all that matters is you have uh, a little cache. These are. Um, Let's say we'll call them pages in memory. And then you've got everything. This is all your data, which you can think of as your disk or whatever. That's far away. And uh, you have a limited amount of storage. We're going to say that there's k different spots here to store data. And so if you, and your CPU is over here. And if you access something uh, that's not in cache, then you're going to have to kick out one of these guys and bring in the data that you actually want. So that's called uh, a cache miss or a fetch, or there's another term that Cargo likes to use, eviction. So you get to store up to k things, uh, and if you and the let's say the program you're running on your CPU is some sequence of accesses, and if the data that you're accessing is in the cache, it's free. Otherwise, you pay one to bring something in, and you have to kick out something. So that is the uh, page replacement strategy. Uh, which this is the algorithmic part. Decide which page to kick out or to evict. 
So that's the general model. Whenever we access something that's not here, we're going to have to kick one, one page out, and the one that we put in is fixed. And we don't preemptively kick out anything, because that could never help us. So online algorithm version is that you're given these accesses one at a time, so you don't know what accesses are going to come, and still you have to decide who to kick out accordingly. So problem clear? It's pretty simple. You've probably thought about it before. Uh, you want to give me some algorithms for this problem? Obvious ones? Yeah. LRU. LRU, least recently used. So that evict whatever was least recently used. That's a nice algorithm because it only requires information about the past. So you just store a timestamp for each page for the last time it was used. And you can find that guy. Uh, you know, it's a data structure's question of how to do it in a small amount of time, but we're not worried about time here. We're just worried about quality or how many uh, page replacement, how many page evictions we need to do versus the offline optimal. So the other one is offline optimal, uh, which you can prove is uh, evicting the page to be used farthest in the future. I won't prove this statement, but it's pretty obvious. It's essentially a greedy algorithm. So you look into the future, you see what, which of the pages that you currently have stored are going to be as far as in the future. That's the best one to evict. Uh, anything earlier, you pay a penalty earlier. Well, so we have to think about this one, because we want to compare and say LRU is not that much worse than OPT. In some <coughs> sense, it's much worse. In other senses, it's not so bad. Uh, any others? There's one other I'll mention, uh, which is first in, first out. It's a funny algorithm in that it doesn't seem like it would be any good, but it's actually just as good as LRU in a certain sense. So first in, first out is evict the oldest uh, loaded page. So it's just viewing the pages as a queue, I guess. OK. So let's start with bad news. In general, today we're going to be doing a lot of upper bounds and a lot of lower bounds. And they're all basically tight. So this is a pretty well understood field. It started with Slater and Tarjan in 1985. They introduced this problem so before online algorithms existed. This is basically the first paper on online algorithms. They proved uh, what we're going to talk about in the deterministic paging setting. But when we get to randomized paging, that's much more recent work. So uh, bad news is that no deterministic algorithm is really very good for a large cache. The best you can hope for is k-competitive. That's quite bad. For a cache of size k, uh, k-competitive is all we can do. So what we'd like for a lower bound is some kind of adversary. So suppose I gave you a deterministic algorithm, uh, and I wanted to now produce an access sequence that makes that algorithm behave very poorly. What should I do? Always access the most recently evicted thing. Good, yeah. So uh, for that to work, I'm going to need, um, let's say there are k plus 1 items that I care about. So there's always, if it's, less, if it's less than or equal to k, I never have to evict anything. So I need to at least have that many. And uh, I'm going to always access the one page that's not in the cache. I'm sometimes going to call it memory, sometimes call it cache. Which is the one that was just evicted every time. So that means that this, I mean, this is an adversary that depends on the algorithm. It's an access sequence that foils a specific algorithm. Uh, for every algorithm, there's a bad access sequence. That's what we're saying here. 
Uh, so the deterministic algorithm is going to spend uh, n uh, evix if the access sequence is of length n. So every time it's going to lose. Now, what we have to show uh, is that opt can do better on this access sequence. So in hindsight, if I knew this was the access sequence, there exists an algorithm that works. So that's a funny thing. For every algorithm, there's a bad access sequence. But for that access sequence, there is a good algorithm. Uh, this is the way competitive works. You've got to really work to make sure your quantifiers are correct. Um, so and that's the offline algorithm. So if I knew that this is going to be the access sequence, I claim for any access sequence, I can achieve an upper bound of n over k. So why? Well, we know what the optimal algorithm is. I'm going to evict the page that's going to be used farthest in the future. So we're looking at k different pages, and we're picking the one that's going to be used farthest in the future. That means that the other k minus one of them should be uh, good. I mean, they're going to be accessed before I access that one guy. Let's say this is the guy I choose to evict. Uh, so then all of these guys are going to be in the cache, and I'm going to access them. This guy must be accessed at least k time steps in the future. So these guys are going to be good. So whoever I evict uh, uh, because there's only k plus 1 things that I have to worry about. So this would, not, this would not work if I had many, many items. I could just be accessing a different item every time. But because I only have k plus 1 items, whichever page I evict, then I have all the other k items in cache right now. And they're all going to be touched before this evicted page gets touched again. So I only end up paying n over k. I'm going to do an eviction, get a page miss every k steps at worst, probably exactly, actually. Um, and so the ratio is k. And so I get a lower bound of k competitive. So that's kind of annoying. Uh, the good news is that you can be k competitive. <laughs> that's not very good news. Uh, but there's a more interesting way of looking at the problem that actually makes things pretty, pretty happy. So uh, to tell you about the good news, I need to define something called a conservative algorithm. This is a particular type of page replacement strategy. And both LRU and FIFO are going to be conservative. So conservative just says uh, that it will spend at most k. Uh, for any sequence of requests uh, that involve at most k distinct pages. I should probably say consecutive. OK, so imagine you have some sequence of accesses. I haven't even specified how you name pages. Maybe they're numbers. And you look at some subsequence like this. You say, well, that only involves two distinct pages. So any reasonable algorithm should really only spend at most two uh, accesses. It's got to load one. It's got to load three. But you might as well not kick them out for the duration you're using them. So as long as there's only k distinct things I'm using in that subsequence, I should be able to achieve a bound of, of at most k. And both LRU and even FIFO achieve that bound. And from an analysis standpoint, this is the only property we're going to need. We're not going to care about LRU and FIFO specifically. And then I have the good news. So any conservative algorithm is k competitive. Uh, 
uh, I'll just sketch the proof. We're going to prove it in a second. But uh, the idea is, well, you look at a block of axes that involve k distinct pages. You're going to spend k. I claim opt has to spend at least one for that. And if you can prove that, you get k competitive. But this is really not very interesting. So I'm going to state a stronger theorem, and then we'll prove that stronger theorem. So and. I'm going to look at what I call a crippled offline algorithm. So the crippled algorithm has a smaller cache. So it's kind of cheating. And this is an idea called resource augmentation. It's not a big cheat. It's kind of reasonable. And uh, augmentation, I should say. This has lots of practical applications, which you will see later in this class. Uh, so the idea is we're going to change how much resources the online algorithm has versus the offline algorithm. So the online algorithm still has a uh, cache of size k. The offline algorithm gets a somewhat smaller cache of size h. You get to choose what h is. In particular, h could equal k. And then the competitive bound we claim is k over k minus h plus 1. So you've got to think a little bit what that means. Um, if k equals h, then this is just k again. So this is a generalization of this statement. If h is k over 2, so it's the offline algorithm has a factor 2 smaller cache, then this is k over k over 2 plus 1. Basically, you get 2 competitive. So if you reduce, if opt has a uh, take home message is if opt has a cache that's half as big as the online algorithm, then you get constant competitive for any, uh, any conservative algorithm, including LRU and FIFO. Great. So that's actually interesting. Now you might say, uh, you know, why am I allowed to make offline have a somewhat smaller cache? Uh, the vague answer is, you know, what's a constant factor between friends? And there are a lot of algorithmic settings where throwing away a constant factor shouldn't really hurt you much. So unless you're like really close to the edge of things just like the whole problem size fitting in cache or something, as long as you're not right at that edge, then changing the cache size by a constant factor shouldn't really change the performance of your algorithm by more than a constant factor. And I assume you have not yet seen cache oblivious algorithms, uh, but you will. And when you do, this will be useful. <laughs> um, but I think I shouldn't spoil that story yet. So let's prove this theorem. And even if you're not interested in this theorem, don't worry, because we'll go to randomized paging. And randomized, we can do a lot better than factor k or resource augmentation or whatever. Uh, so bear with me. This is not a very hard uh, proof to do. So um, we have our access sequence. What I'd like to do is partition it into sections, where in each section, I access k distinct items. And I want to make the, the sections as large as possible. And I'm going to call the sections phases. So let's divide the access sequence into maximal phases. I'm just going to do it left to right. Uh, each with k distinct pages. So I'm just going to take the longest prefix of the sequences that 
uh, all involve k different things. As soon as I'm about to access a k plus first page, then I'll draw a line, start a new phase, and then I'll take a maximal sub string here until I have k things. I guess the very last one doesn't have exactly k. It might have less than k. But all but the last one have exactly k distinct pages accessed. The length of each of those phases could be longer than k, but it's at least k. OK, now conservative algorithm says, hey, for each of those phases, we're going to spend at most k. So clearly, uh, conservative algorithm spends at most k per phase. And that's this. <laughs> now we want to prove that opt spends at least k minus h plus 1. So the, the analysis is, com is independent between the phases. You just look at each one separately. And with the exception of the very last phase, this will be true. And so at least asymptotically, you get this uh, competitive bound. So why is this true? Well, let's start with a case where k equals h. So the caches are the same size. Then I claim op spends at least 1. OK, uh, let's. So this is per phase. Uh, let's suppose uh, that the phase first accesses x. That's the name. x is the name of the page at the very beginning. So maybe we're here, and there's x. So we know that we've just accessed k different things. Our cache is full. It's got stuff in it. Uh, and now we access x. And there are two possibilities. Uh, either x is in the cache or it's not. OK, so where should I go next? Uh, so this is that proof continued. So if uh, x is in ops cache, uh, well, let's start with when it's not in the cache. It's <laughs> a little easier. Uh, then we pay 1. Okay. Otherwise, uh, x is in the cache. I feel like I'm off by one here. OK, so it's, it's not quite. I lied a little bit when I said that the phases are independent of each other. So uh, it's a little more subtle than that. So we're looking at this phase, and we say, oh, well, maybe at this moment x is in the cache, so this access is free. It's hard to argue much about that phase. But we can then look at the previous phase and say, well, then this phase, which does not include x, x cannot be in here, because this was the longest possible uh, phase from a, in a prefix sense that involved at most k distinct things. So there are k distinct things in here. None of them were x. Otherwise, I could have added x to this phase. So x is not over here. And yet, at this moment, x was in the cache for the optimal strategy. That means that this whole phase was essentially wasting one of the cache slots. Okay. In here, effectively, um, so in the previous phase, effectively using uh, cache of size h minus 1. So h is the size of ops cache. So either way, we kind of gain 1. Either uh, we paid 1 immediately to access x, 
or we argue that we had a cache of one smaller size in the previous step. Now, if you add everything up, in both cases, that's going to cost one, because we're getting, there's an additive dependence on h here. If I decrease h by one, that hurts me by one. Uh, so, and it will cost one more. So either way, we effectively pay one. Now, let's look at, uh, so where does this k minus h plus one come from? Really, I've only justified this one. <laughs> Not very impressive, but it's important in the case where k and h are equal, because then that's our only, the only thing we can argue. So now we're thinking about uh, opt whose cache is much smaller. It's only size h. Think of h being like k over 2. And still, we're looking at a phase of length k. So it involves k distinct <coughs> items. And somehow we have to uh, access them all within a cache of size h. So uh, all we need to do is say, well, let's go back to our, the current. Uh, we're looking at a phase whose first access is to x. So now look at the other items. There's k minus 1 other items, distinct. How many of them could be in the cache? Uh, after I access h, or sorry, after I access x, only h minus 1. So among the k minus 1 remaining distinct items, At most, h minus 1 are in the cache. Why h minus 1? Because we just loaded x. And either x was in the cache or we brought it into the cache. Uh, so what the remaining useful things are at most h minus 1. There's k minus 1 things we're going to access. So within this phase, we have to bring in those other items. So we have to pay k minus 1 minus h minus 1, which is just k minus h. So we get a k minus h penalty within this phase, and we get that for every phase. And we get this added of 1 either in this phase or the previous phase. So a little bit ugly, but you add up all the phases, and you get k minus h plus 1 times the number of phases versus k times the number of phases. Number of phases cancels. And the ratio is this guy. Any questions about that proof? Yeah? How do we know that if x wasn't in office cache, that it gets brought into office cache? Oh, uh, because we're looking at this moment where x is accessed. And, and the, sorry, I didn't say, but the model is when you access an item, you must bring it into cache. You can't just access it from the deeper memory and not bring it into cache. That doesn't really change things more than some constant factor. But, uh, so this result would change in terms of constant factors, maybe, if you didn't make that assumption, I guess. Uh, but, uh, my model is when you access something, you have to put it into cache. You have to kick somebody out. So that's why x has to be brought in here uh, in this case. And also why the cache is one smaller. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Did you the final phase? Uh, final phase. Mm, mumble, mumble. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. To be cautious, you probably have to pay. There's a final, there's an edge case in the end. There's also in the beginning, depending on whether you assume that your cache starts empty or full, which could also change things slightly. Uh, I'm just going to call those all in this. It's kind of cheating, but it's not really big O of 1. Uh, in this case, we're paying maybe big O of k or something to not worry about those effects. So I don't know for sure whether you can get rid of that additive term. I'll just say for now, additive term. Don't worry about it. For a long enough sequence, it's clearly not a big deal, unless your cache is really big. Other questions? All right, that's the easy stuff. Now we get to go to randomized paging. So let's do randomized paging. Maybe before we go to randomized paging, let's talk a little bit in general about randomized online algorithms. And then we'll 
get to paging specifically. So the idea with randomization is the, before the online algorithm makes a decision. So it gets a piece of the input, then the online algorithm is going to say, uh, well, I don't know whether to do this or this, so I'll flip a coin. And the idea is one of those was the right decision. You have some probability of getting the right one. Whereas if you just make a deterministic choice, the adversary will always destroy you and say, well, you chose the wrong one. Sorry. Uh, just like we saw in this bad news proof, uh, where you just say, well, whatever you brought in, we're going to, uh, whatever you kicked out, that's the next one that happens to be the access. If I instead chose a random page to kick out, instead of uh, you know, the deterministic algorithm picks any page, it doesn't really matter, you get screwed. If I chose a random one and my adversary didn't know which one I picked, then there's a chance that I'm lucky. And while the adversary has a chance of screwing me, it's only like a 1 over k chance. So that seems a lot better for that instance. Turns out kicking out a random page is not a good algorithm, but it's a good algorithm for that input. Uh, Got to start somewhere. Um, OK, so a randomized online algorithm. So that's the general spirit is that we're going to thwart our adversary by flipping coins and forcing our adversary to not know everything about what we're doing. Now, this depends on uh, what your model of adversary is. So there are three types of adversaries that are commonly studied. Well, actually two, <laughs> but I'll tell you three. I'll tell you why we don't use the third one. So the main model is called an oblivious adversary. The idea with an oblivious, oblivious adversary uh, is that it doesn't see your coin flip. So the adversary knows what algorithm you're running, but it doesn't get to see the results of your coin flips. It just knows that you flip some coins. You make, it knows how you make the decisions according to how you flip the coins, but it doesn't get to see the outcomes of the flips. So it's quite, uh, its hands are pretty tied behind its back in terms of what it is allowed to do. Now, this is a pretty reasonable model. So let's think about paging. Uh, are you really going to design a program that thwarts your specific paging algorithm? Well, maybe. Maybe you're really annoying. You write some code. And you run it on your system, hoping to bring down the system and make it go really slowly. OK, that happens. Uh, but how could the program see what coin flips the operating system is ma making? You could even imagine the operating system is doing it in protected space. It doesn't show, that, and the program cannot figure out uh, which coin flips it makes. And so the, the algorithm is kind of oblivious to uh, what, uh, what the system is doing. So it's a pretty reasonable model. And if you imagine, the, it's sort of in between being super adversarial and being mostly adversarial, where you want to understand the worst case. The whole point of algorithms is to understand the worst case. But usually, you're not trying to make it explicitly bad by looking at the coin flips and destroying the system, hopefully. Uh, of course, you could imagine a world where when you make a coin flip, you make a decision, and you spend slightly different amounts of time. And so from a security standpoint, you could imagine figuring this out. This is what we'd call the fully adaptive adversary. If you really want to bring down a system, this is what you should use, I guess. Uh, but it's not very interesting to study, because it's just like deterministic algorithms. So if you see all the coin flips, then you, your algorithm might as well be deterministic. And so from a randomized perspective, it's not interesting to look at this. That, that is the, the case we just studied. Okay? If you see the outcomes of the coin flips immediately, the adversary can do exactly this algorithm and screw you over. Now, there is something in between, which is called an adaptive adversary. Adaptive adversary uh, knows the previous coin flips, but not the future. It 
So it's kind of like an online algorithm, actually. You know everything that's happened in the past, uh, but now your adversary is an online algorithm. It can only adapt to the coin flips that have occurred in the past, but it doesn't know the very next thing you're going to do. So in this kind of strategy, uh, it depends exactly what you mean by the next coin flip. It still may be kind of bad for paging. Um, anyway, we're going to focus here on the oblivious adversary. But here's three different models for you to think so about. So does the oblivious adversary see your previous cash decisions, or does it see nothing? Uh, the oblivious one, sorry? Yeah. The oblivious one does not see what you're storing in the cache. Otherwise, it could derive your coin flips for the most part. Yeah, so I should. Yeah, so the only thing it knows is what algorithm you're using. Right. It doesn't see the execution of the algorithm because I think that pretty much pushes you down to fully adaptive, although maybe you could try to obfuscate things. In this model, I don't think you could really obfuscate what you're doing. And in particular, this algorithm will still, this adversary will kill you if you know what's currently in the cache. So uh, the idea is you don't get to know the coin flips or anything that's computed from them in particular, the choices you make. So you can argue about which of these models is the most reasonable. I'll tell you, most of randomized, you've seen randomized algorithms, right, in this class? Some? They all assume oblivious adversary. That is the model. You don't, if your adversary knows what the coin flips are, then you're deterministic again, and that's this model. So you've already been implicitly assuming this. Now we're making it very explicit. All right, what else? Um, so, why randomization? This is a fun kind of motivational speech, I suppose. Uh, I want to change this in a second. There's a good reason for randomization. If you know a little bit of game theory, like Nash, Equilibria and stuff. Have you covered any game theory in this class? No. It's on a piece set. Good, so you should know it. <laughs> uh, I think you've all played rock, paper, scissors. So <laughs> you can think of rock, paper, scissors as a game. And there's various strategies for, let's call them strats, for player A. I'm thinking about two player games, strategies for player B. And for each. Depending on who chooses what, you say make a simultaneous choice, and you get some payoff. And uh, you know, in this case, one player A or player B wins, and the other one loses. It's called a, a zero-sum game, uh, that one player's loss is the other player's win. OK, what's the optimal strategy to rock, paper, scissors? I'm actually serious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uniformly choose one at random. Yeah, you can prove the best strategy is one third, one third, one third. You flip a three sided coin, you, you play that three sided die, I don't know, and you play that, and that, that will beat everything with the maximum chance of profit or whatever, which is zero, I suppose. I mean, or 50 50. Um, and that's the best you can do. You know, is deterministic a good strategy? What if I always play rock? No. <laughs> Other player will always play paper. If I always play paper, I always play scissors. If I always play scissors, I always play rock. Right? So there's no good deterministic strategy here. And that's what we're seeing with page replacement. Uh, but there is a reasonable, I mean, there's the optimal strategy is randomized for both players. Both players actually, in this case, have the same strategy. Now, in paging, or actually online algorithms in general, the two players are the online algorithm and the adversary. And so, as you might expect, the optimal strategy is randomized for both. So we're going to randomize the strategy for the online algorithm. The adversary, as a result, should randomize. Uh, it's actually not that big a deal. But uh, they will both randomize to try to fake each other out, essentially. And so it's the same, just as in rock, paper, scissors, B doesn't get to see what A does until it's too late. So otherwise, it's not interesting. That would be the fully adaptive situation. All right, anything else? Uh, I need to redefine alpha competitive. So for randomized 
alpha competitive. Uh, it's going to be for all inputs, online algorithm of x, uh, the expected value of the online algorithm of x is at most alpha times the optimal offline algorithm of x. Now, optimal offline algorithm of x is still deterministic, because in hindsight, there's no reason to randomize. Okay, there was one best sequence of decisions to make, maybe more than one, but one best cost. And the only expectation, the only thing that's random is how the algorithm executes. So that we need to, we're going to take expectation. You could also try for with high probability bound, but for whatever reason, online algorithms only consider expected bounds. So that's where we're going. So I didn't say explicitly uh, they can flip coins. You can also think of a randomized online algorithm as a probability distribution over deterministic algorithms. Same thing. Flipping coins is just branching from one deterministic algorithm to another. Um, but if you think of it that way, then it's really more like this game picture where you have many possible strategies. You're going to decide on some probability distribution of those strategies and hope that that is good. All right. So uh, let's go back to paging now. We've talked about one algorithm, which was uniformly just pick a page that's in cache and kick it out. That algorithm is actually k-competitive, but we're not so interested in k-competitive because any conservative algorithm is k-competitive deterministically. So let me tell you another algorithm. I would say this is not an obvious algorithm at all. I mean, it's obvious, but it's totally not obvious that it's any good. I'm going to call it mark. So when there's a, I maybe haven't used this term yet, but when there's a page fault, so meaning you access something and it's not in the cache, then I have three steps. Get to the last step first. Oh, I gotta make room, sorry. So the general idea is when you access something, you bring in a new page, mark it. And then I prefer to kick out unmarked pages. Ones I just brought in, I want to get my bank for my buck, kind of. And so I want to mark it, meaning I shouldn't, uh, when I evict, I'm going to evict a random unmarked page. So that means pages will stay in forever, except for this very first step, which is if all the pages are marked, well then, I mean, it's all the same thing. So unmark everything. So that's the algorithm. Initially, say all the pages are marked or all of them are unmarked. It doesn't really matter. They'll, if they're all marked, they'll become unmarked. Then we're going to, initially, we're evicting random pages. But as we pull pages in, we try to keep them for as long as possible. There's like two, two types of pages. Doesn't seem like this would help much, but it's order log k competitive. Big improvement. And we will prove a matching lower bound that log k is the best you can do. So this is really good, actually. All right. This is proved by Amos Fiat. Uh, cool guy. He taught me to play poker for the first time. Um, and it's a very nice theorem. And it's going to be pretty similar to the proof we had before, at least at the top level. We're going to look at maximal phases uh, that involve k distinct page, pages being accessed, okay? just like before. So we have phase one, phase two, phase three. We're going to analyze roughly phase by phase. 
And let me start. Uh, OK. So some observations. We've got to be a little careful here. We want to talk about things that are not random as much as possible. So first claim is that the notion of phases is not about randomness. It's just about the input. So it has nothing to do with the execution of this algorithm. Uh, in fact, most of this proof will not mention randomness at all. It's like at the very end, it's like, oh, there's some probability, and then we get a good bound. All right, so phases are a deterministic thing, how we split up the input into phases. The randomness is all in the algorithm. Uh, I claim that this happens exactly at the end of each phase. Okay, this is pretty easy to prove by induction. So let's assume that at the beginning of a phase, so here are my phases. Let's say at the beginning here, uh, everything is unmarked. Okay, that means the very first thing I access is going to bring something in and mark it. Uh, and so on. There's k distinct things here in the phase. And so every guy that I, every distinct thing that I access, I bring it in and mark it. Uh, that means at this moment, when I'm about to access a k plus first distinct thing, all the k items in cache have been marked. Um, and then I will unmark all. So the unmark all happens exactly at these boundaries. This is a nice structure. Yeah, question. So do you mark k to exit units? Yeah, I was just thinking of that. I think yes. Uh, so this is part of the algorithm. And then also on a non-fault, probably has a better name, but cache hit, I think, uh, mark it. I want the, what I just said to be true, so I better mark them even if they're already in cache. Okay, so I might unmark all, but then I'll mark it again if I still am using it. Good. So. This is nice uh, because it says, as soon as I access a page for the first time in a phase, then I guarantee that that item will stay inside the cache for the entire phase. This is why I said I want to keep it around for as long as possible. What that means is keep it around for the rest of the phase. Okay, so you could actually just keep track of phases and do the same thing. But it's equivalent to this algorithm, a little bit simpler than keeping track of phases. OK, uh, anything else I need? OK, also at this moment, that means that in the algorithm, the cache stores uh, these items. I'm going to call these items SI for phase I. So claim is at the end of the phase, the cache will store exactly the, the k distinct items that were in the phase. Okay, that just follows from what I said. But I wanted to give that a name. And now I can proceed to the interesting part of the proof. Uh, OK, one more thing that's interesting. Uh, I really, therefore, only care about the first time I access an item x. Every future access to x in the same phase is guaranteed to be free. So I'm just going to ignore these accesses, basically erase them. I can afford to erase them because the algorithm won't pay anything for them. Ops may be paid for them, but if I make ops performance even better, then, and I still prove a competitive bound, then uh, I'm doing, then the original sequence does, is just as good. Okay, it doesn't hurt to improve ops performance by modifying the sequence. So I really only care about this first access to each item within a phase. So I'll ignore everything outside, and uh, later items. Now, I'm going to distinguish uh, two types of accesses. So let's say we're accessing an item x. Uh, I'm going to call it fresh if x is not in si minus 1. So I'm looking at phase i. I should probably mention that. Here's phase i. And it's going to be stale otherwise. So I'm accessing an item x. This is in SI, of course. So I 
access it within phase i. So either it was also accessed in the previous phase or not. I call it fresh or stale accordingly. These behave very differently. Um, let's see, for fresh access, it wasn't in the previous thing. And I know that at this moment, before I started this phase, the cache is exactly si minus 1. Therefore, when I access x in here, uh, it will not be in cache, guaranteed. Because I'm looking at the first time I access x within this phase, it wasn't in the cache before. It's still not going to be in it whenever this x gets accessed. And so I definitely pay 1. The claim is opt also has to pay 1. Half. Amortized. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> uh, but So that's actually an easier case in some sense. The, we'll, we'll prove that in a moment. So the other case is stale accesses. So here, the item x is in both of these. So it's in si minus 1 intersect si. I label this si minus 1. Here the hope is, we, we know that x was in the cache at this moment. Now if x is the very first thing in the phase, like in the previous proof, uh, I'm happy. It's definitely in the cache. But this is not the previous proof. x was an arbitrary item could be it's accessed much later. And it's possible that the other things I access, in fact, it's exactly the fresh accesses that are trouble. Whenever I do a fresh access, I'm kicking something out. And that something might be x. So the worry is that there are some fresh accesses in here. Each of them has a chance of kicking out x. If they don't kick out x, then this will be free, because x was in the cache at this moment. The only worry is that we kick it out sometime in this phase before the first access to x. The claim is that happens with low probability. Okay, so we're going to pay if x is evicted in this phase before that access. Uh, and we claim this is fairly rare. Now, it's not super rare. That's why we get the log k instead of 1 or constant. But it's rare enough that uh, we're not going to lose too much. So that's the high level version of the proof. Now we do the real proof. Any questions so far? Cool. So uh, here's a claim. Let's see if I can. Justify. I want to look at the cost of uh, stale access because the cost of uh, I'm still analyzing the algorithm, not opt. Later, I'm going to have to analyze opt. And the algorithm, we know it pays one for every fresh access. So that's clear. The question is about the stale accesses. When does that happen? So I claim the expected cost, which is just the probability of the cost being one, is f over k minus s where um, f uh, fresh and s stale accesses so far in uh, the phase. Okay, so we're looking from the beginning of the phase till now. Here's where I access x. There's some fresh accesses. There's some stale ones, which are mixed. Let's just count them. So there's f fresh ones and s stale ones before this access to x. And x is stale. And so my worry is that the fresh ones kicked out x. The stale ones help me. Well, hurt me, whatever. They, they do something. I guess they hurt me. Uh, but here's the idea. So let's start with a case where everything is fresh up till x. So then the probability that this one kicks out x is 1 over k. Probability this one kicks out x is 1 over k. I use a union bound. I guess the probability that any of them kick out x is f over k. Okay? But there's the stale axes too. And they complicate things a little bit because when I do a stale access, I mark that item, which means from then on, uh, that item will stay in the cache, effectively reducing my cache size and increasing the chance that I hit x. 
question. Do you have to be careful since your fresh accesses don't kick out uh, independent um, random members of the previous desktop? Uh, fresh accesses don't kick out independent. They do. I evict a random unmarked page. So the only worry is that I have marked a page. And that's what the stale axes do. Yeah? Sorry? The new thing you bring in to replace the thing you can also marked. So you're saying there should be a minus F here as well? Maybe. Maybe. It does seem like both of them are bad. Hopefully that doesn't hurt my proof. <laughs> Uh, can I simplify that at all? Anybody good with fractions? I don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> Blame Carger. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So let's check. <laughs> Should there be a minus F there? So I feel like if I access a fresh guy, it's, it is marked. So could I change the algorithm to fix this? Maybe I shouldn't mark the new pages. I should only mark the old pages. Seems weird. Uh, that fix it. Uh, chance of me getting this right is uh, slim. <laughs> so what if I remove this step then uh, is it still the case that everybody is fresh or stale? Yes. Uh, is this other thing I said true, that by the end? No, that's not true. So I think that's a worry. I think I got to keep this step in, unfortunately. <clears throat> I think it's OK for some reason. <laughs> Let's see. When I do a fresh access, I kick. So it's definitely not exactly correct. <laughs> this expectation is definitely smaller than infinity, given that it's a number either 0 or 1. <laughs> yeah. No, but actually, f cannot be k. Because uh, for this to be a stale access, that means that we're doing a, a, a new item that hasn't been accessed before. And so f is at most k minus 1. Sorry, you have an, another idea? Have one? No? So f plus s is less than k. f plus s is strictly less than k. Yeah, that's what makes this a vaguely reasonable amount. It's also less than 1 in the original option. And we're sort of in the same point. We'll say it's like 1. Yeah. So I mean, you get something out of like just um, taking expectation over the different positions. Yeah, uh, in fact, what's to come is uh, an analysis along those lines. Maybe I should just proceed and see if we can fix it. I'll show you the rest of the proof and uh, see what to do. The idea is that the early accesses are very likely to succeed. The later ones are more likely to, to fail. So can you explain that f over k minus s minus f? Oh, I'm not sure it's yeah. exactly okay. Right. So let's double check. So the idea is um, there are f fresh accesses before now. We want to check. The, I claim the probability that each one kicks me out is at most 1 over k minus s minus f because there's k. Uh, 
items in the cache to choose from, except S, my, S plus F of them have already been marked, so I'm not going to choose them when I evict somebody. Ah, OK. Yeah. So maybe I could be a little more precise in that point. Oh, this is going to be messy. <laughs> Because you're just going to be evicting f out of the k, and that can be x of the probability f of k. Oh, you're saying I'm double counting the f, the, the fresh guys. Yeah, you don't need to do a union that. You can just like flip it overall. So, yeah. That would make me much happier. Ah, <laughs> uh, I see. I'm choosing f things out of k minus s things. Oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the idea is if the S's came at the beginning, those all get locked in. So that's kind of the worst case in this imaginary scenario. Um, and so there are K minus S slots remaining in the worst case. That's how many are unmarked. And then I'm just going to pick F of them. Yeah. Whew. That does work. <laughs> Good. So that's, and the chance that any of them hit the k minus s guys, which x has to be in the set, uh, is exactly f over k minus s. Thanks. Whew. Much better. All right, back on track. Now, uh, that was the cost of a single access. So now we're going to add this up over an entire phase. In this imaginary scenario, the f it's worst if the fresh accesses happen at the beginning, I claim. Why the beginning? Because then f is large. But this probability, I mean, it's a trade-off, I suppose. You want, in the worst case, the f's are out at the beginning, and also the s's are. <laughs> Magical. <laughs> That's not actually possible. Um, so what is the total cost? Well, we certainly pay f for the fresh axes. We're paying one each. So then there's the issue of the stale axes. So the stale cost is going to be, at most, uh, this added up as s increases. So for the first stale access, s equals 0. For the second stale access, s equals 1. The third, s equals 2, and so on. So there, it's all going to be f, and then it's going to be times 1 over k. That's when s is 0. And then we're going to have uh, s equal 1, and then s equals 2, and so on. I could actually go off to infinity here, but uh, or to 1, I suppose. Uh, but in reality, it's going to be 1 over fi, I think, maybe plus 1, plus 1, uh, because we know exactly how many stale accesses there are. It's k minus fi, because everybody's fresh or stale. OK, now, does you guys know this? One word. Log. Well, that's a good word for computer scientists. <laughs> Mathematician would say harmonic series, but log's a good answer. I like log. Do you know what base of the log? E. Do you know the second order term? Minus gamma. Yeah, very good. Anyway, we just need that it's log. <laughs> this is order fi. It's, ac it's actually, I'll be a little more precise. It is natural log of k. There's a minus gamma, whatever, but uh, that's an upper bound. Cool. Okay. That's where the log comes from. OK, so that's why I really wanted the probability to be f over k minus s. If it was f over k minus s minus f, this would not work. There'd be a minus fi, and I don't know what it would mean. Uh, actually, maybe it would work now that I look at it. <laughs> Because we only go down to here, it would still be bounded by a harmonic. Huh, all that work. We didn't even need it. Oh, well. Uh, so total cost is, at most, the number of fresh axes times long k. Uh, I should do a big O, because I've got a plus 1 here. But eh, basically, ln k times number of fresh axes. So the question is, what about opt? I claim opt is big. 
well, I claim that opt is roughly at least the number of fresh accesses divided by 2. And here we're going to do some kind of amortization. Uh, so I'm going to use a potential function, like any good amortization. I'm going to look at the differences between the mark algorithm we're analyzing and opt, the offline optimal algorithm. And phi sub i is going to be that value at the start of phase i. So this is a fun argument. So in phase i, we have fi fresh accesses. The question is, does opt pay for them? We, uh, Mark definitely pays for them. Now, if, if uh, phi sub i here is 0, then Mark and opt are actually in the same position, and every fresh access will also hurt opt. So in general, uh, opt must pay uh, fi minus phi i. If it's not going to pay them, that means they're already in the cache, and that has to be chargeable to phi i. So the, re the remainder of these fresh guys are still fresh in opt, and opt will have to pay for them in that phase. Okay, that's one argument. Now we're going to make a separate argument. These cannot be added together, but they're both true. Uh, second argument is that at the end of phase i, we are missing phi sub i plus 1 of si. I think I better draw a picture. So here's our phase. This is si. We have phi i here. We have phi i plus 1 here. So we know the cache for, uh, for mark, the mark algorithm, at the end, the cache is exactly si. Uh, but we know that opt differs by exactly phi sub i plus 1. So phi sub i plus 1 of these items must not be in the cache at this moment. When did they get kicked out? During this phase. Because they were accessed in this phase. Everybody in si is touched in here. They were brought into the cache. That means sometime between when they are accessed here and this moment in time, x must have been evicted. All of these items must be evicted. Now that costs. That means there was a cash miss. That means there was a, an eviction. So separately, opt pays at least phi sub i plus 1 in this phase. OK? Amazingly, this is enough. So I have these two lower bounds. Opt is at least this, and it's at least this. You cannot add these lower bounds because they're both counting the same things in different ways, potentially. Uh, but what we can conclude is that opt is at least the max. In, uh, when I say opt, I mean opt sub i, the amount spent during phase i, is at least this and this. Uh, and the max is at least the average. So I can do the 1 half. That's where the half comes from. Average is that. Now that is a nice thing. Because when I add these up, it telescopes, and I get half the number of fresh accesses. Done. Believe it? <laughs> I guess I also have to check that the potential, I have to look at the biggest, the, the final potential, which is positive. Uh, but that could only help me. Also, the initial potential at phi sub 0 before anything gets started. Uh, if that was high, then, I'm not improved, then my opt bound would go down. But we assume that I guess the algorithms start in the same state. That seems fair. And so then phi sub 0 is 0. So amortization works out. Telescoping sum. It's, it's not even obvious this is going to end up telescoping, but magically it does. All right. So we end up with something like 2 times ln k competitive, 
with this mark algorithm. Any questions about the algorithm? OK. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is lower bounds. So I claim that log k up to some constant factor is actually the best you can obtain. This is also proved by fiat. So remember what this means in terms of adversaries. I claim that if you give me any randomized paging algorithm, there is an oblivious adversary. So it gets to know your algorithm, but it doesn't get to know what random outcomes you have. It forces you to pay uh, omega log k times something, and opt only pays the something. So you're log k away from the optimal. In fact, the adversary is very simple. It's kind of like our last adversary. We said, well, k plus 1 different items that we're accessing. That turns out to still be a tough case. The uh, question is, what should the adversary do now? Because it doesn't know what the algorithm's doing. Maybe the algorithm now is kicking out random pages. Maybe it's always kicking out the oldest page. Uh, it's doing something with some coin flips. I don't know what to do other than just random. <laughs> so the adversary is uniform random. It's actually the same adversary for all algorithms. <laughs> kind of funny uh, that this is really bad, but it is actually bad. Why? Well, uh, let's start with online algorithms. So online algorithm, I mean, it almost doesn't matter what you do. If you know that the next page to be accessed is uniform random, which we now know, uh, the best online strategy is also to just, uh, in fact, any page you kick out will be, uh, will be a bad one with probability 1 over k. So, or more generally, uh, the things you're accessing are uniform random. Your cache is basically going to be random at that point. The chance that the adversary asks you to access the one guy that's not there is uh, 1 over k plus 1. K plus, uh, be 1 over k to be safe, somewhere around there per access. So this is going to be like n over k total and expectation. All right, I claim opt is better, though, by log k factor. You see why? <laughs> Um, I want to look at phases, uh, slightly different phases uh, of all k plus 1 pages. So uh, again, decompose into the longest prefix, or the first prefix when finally all k plus 1 pages have been touched. So. Uh, what can I tell you about opt? Well, opt, until that moment where the k plus first page is accessed, opt is going to be happy. It's going to load in those k pages and just keep reusing them over and over. Because uh, it's always kicking out the guy that's going to be accessed farthest in the future with knowledge of the future. Okay, so the real question is, how long are the phases? If I'm accessing pages uniformly at random, how many accesses do I need to do until all k plus 1 pages have been touched at least once? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. This is the coupon collector problem. You have k coupons. You get a random coupon every time, I don't know, every time you open your spam mail. <laughs> How many spam mails do you have to open until you get all k plus 1 of them? Uh, about k log k. That's where the log comes from. So the expected length of a phase is k log k. That means I forget the base of the log. 
<laughs> theta k log k. Uh, and so that means, roughly speaking, that the cost is n over k log k. That's going to be how many different phases there are. So, uh, yeah. This division, though, is a bit of a mess because this is expectation. You can't just take reciprocals with expectations. So actually, it's tricky. You've got a bunch of phases. They're IID. They each have this expectation. You want to say how many of them until it's over. It turns out the right answer is theta n over k log k, but I'm not going to prove it here. It's kind of messy probability. Apparently, this is called something called renewal theory. There's a lot of ways to prove it. Renewal theory will make it easier. Uh, cool. Five minutes to tell you just a little bit more. So roughly speaking, this is why you have to lose a log k factor, because a perfect coupon collector doesn't kick out anything until all the coupons have come in buys you a log k, whereas you really have no idea what's going on. So everything is, your cash is random, you don't have knowledge of the future, you don't know which coupons to hang on to and which one will be the last k plus first coupon, so you lose that log k factor. Now, uh, one fun thing to notice is that for the lower bound, we had a randomized adversary but the algorithm could be pretty much anything in this case. In particular, the, the algorithm could be always kick out the item in slot number one. Slot number one? Well, uh, any deterministic algorithm should be OK here. There's no reason to randomize the algorithm when you know that the accesses that are coming are, already have randomness in them. Conversely, when we had a randomized mark algorithm, the adversary really didn't need to be, uh, I mean, to think about the worst case, the adversary wasn't really having to be randomized also. So this is actually a general principle, which is, that didn't sound very convincing. But, uh, it's a general principle called Yao's Minimax principle. It applies to any randomized algorithm, in particular online algorithms. And uh, so many mins and maxes, I'm going to have to copy it. And it's yet another form of duality. I'm sure you've seen at least one in this class, probably more. So this is what we normally think of from an algorithm design perspective. We want to choose the best algorithm, the minimum cost for a randomized algorithm A. What does best algorithm mean? Well, we take the worst case input and then take the expectation over the execution of that algorithm on that input. So we take the maximum, the worst case over all inputs, and we take the best algorithm. This is the best upper bound. On the other hand, you could think about the lower bound perspective. So this is the max over all input distributions, d, that's going to be the adversary, and then the min over all deterministic algorithms, this is the funny thing, of the expected cost of a, uh, given that x is drawn from d. OK, uh, so this is the worst input. But I'm going to randomize the input, so I'm going to give you an input distribution. And what does worst mean? Well, it means that all algorithms perform badly. So I want to take the, the very best deterministic algorithm for that distribution. It's just like this oblivious game. right? Up here, we actually did it up here as well. I could have chosen a random input. But instead, I, I chose the worst input. That's worse than random. I mean, this is the absolute worst case. Right? And this is the obliviousness of the adversary. The adversary knows A, but it doesn't know the execution of A. So it really can't adapt to anything. This is in the, all in the oblivious model. So if I take the worst input, uh, I get something here. On the other hand, I'm taking the best algorithm. But I get to randomize the input distribution then the claim is these two things are equal. So in fact, we didn't save anything from doing max and min instead of randomized uh, whatever. 
these come out to the same thing. If you randomize the algorithm, there's no sense in randomizing the input. If you randomize the input, there's no sense in randomizing the algorithm. Why is this true? One minute. Uh, game theory, linear programming, duality. Uh, in general, von Neumann proved something essentially like this. In a two-player game, if you know one player's strategy, if it's already given to you, then your strategy is deterministic. Right? If I know they're always going to play rock, then I play paper. Um, and in fact, you don't gain anything out of that. If, of course, if it's rock, then I'm going to dominate. But if I know that the other player's strategy is one third, one third, one third, I'll choose paper. There's no reason for me to randomize my solution if I know the opponent is randomizing. Okay, so there's a proof by example. <laughs> but in general, this is true. You can prove it through linear programming duality. Uh, it's the same kind of max min equals min max fun statement. And this is a useful thing in general for online algorithms, in general for randomized algorithms. If you're thinking about upper bounds, randomize the algorithm. Thinking about lower bounds, randomize the distribution. That's it. <laughs>